Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the changing energy landscape and its impact on economic development in America webinar. I'm Rick Weddle, President and CEO of the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance and the Chair of IEDC's Think Tank, the Economic Development Research Partners, or EDRP. EDRP is dedicated to advancing thought leadership in the profession of economic development. With 64 members across all uh, communities and counties in the country, it presents a very strong and dynamic research agenda going forward. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Also joining us today are four experts who will share insight into how economic developers are adapting to changes in America's energy landscape. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping notes from IEDC. First, please note that all attendees will be muted during the webinar. To ask a question of the speakers, please type your questions into the question box. During the Q&A period at the end of the session, I will pose your questions to the panelists. Within 24 hours of today's webinar, an evaluation will be mailed to you by IADC. Please take time to complete the evaluation as we do use the feedback to improve our web seminars. At the end of this evaluation, you'll receive a link to download today's presentations. So now let's get started. I'd like to introduce today's speakers, uh, beginning with David Moss, Executive Vice President of the Greater Des Moines Partnership, an organization dedicated to economic and community development in Greater Des Moines area. David is also a member of EDRP and has over 35 years of experience in the field of economic development. During that time, he has and his economic development team, along with state and local partners, have secured more than $10 billion in capital investment on economic development projects. Today, David will be giving us a brief overview of EDRP's report, The Changing Energy Landscape and Its Impact on Economic Development in America, as well as some background information on each area of energy we'll be discussing today. With that, I'll hand things over to you, David. Thank you, Rick. Well, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, today's webinar. and. Uh, let me make sure I can tell you a little bit about how this project came about. First of all, is that the IEDC um, staff and organization and leadership has been working for many years um, helping uh, communities that have been impacted by the, um, the decline of the uh, coal generation and coal production in uh, Appalachia and other areas uh, of the United States. And uh, given the dynamic changes that are going on in today's uh, energy field uh, with the shell, uh, revelation, uh, revolution of natural gas with shale oil production, uh, growing a renewable portfolio, we felt it was uh, an appropriate time to really take a, a look at the whole energy landscape to see really what the market changes uh, are, are actually happening how those are impacting local, local communities, and how economic development professionals can be prepared for uh, changes. This EDRP covered the four main uh, sources of energy production in, in the United States, coal, nuclear energy, oil, natural gas, renewables. An important part of this uh, EDRP paper I think are the case studies that really give um, the economic development professional uh, a real sense of what communities are going through, what solutions they're um, identifying, and how they're implementing those action plans. As most everybody on this uh, webinar knows, that you know coal uh, for you know for decades has been the primary source of uh, of uh, production for our energy plants around, around the United States. Uh, but there is a decline in coal use, uh, environmental concerns. Uh, coal, coal now only represents about 30% of the U.S. power generation capacity. So many, many, many states have been impacted by the decline of the uh, use of coal and, and energy. Uh, there are 16 states that have been impacted, uh, the three top states that have had the biggest impact or the, or the biggest producers of coal right now are Wyoming, West Virginia, and Kentucky. So um, 
So this shift to natural gas and, and renewables has had an impact on communities, and uh, the report uh, goes into that. Um, and so what are economic developers doing? Uh, they're developing plans, um, really extensive community-based plans, looking at um, workforce development issues, uh, trying to attract um, new businesses to the area to diversify the, the regional economy. Uh, entrepreneurship and, and small business development can be important uh, aspects of, of growing your own uh, companies. Um, in workforce development, we've got a great case study in the report on Appalachia Sky, and I encourage you to take a look at it. But um, with, with the leadership of AEP and, AEP and others, uh, they're, they're retraining their workforce to um, to work in the aerospace industry uh, away from the, uh, the, the coal industry. So um, again, um, a lot of good information here for communities that are impacted. And then also natural gas um, has been a stable part of the energy mix for, for many years. Um, there's 61 nuclear power plants. Uh, there's a map in the report that illustrates the location of these power plants. Um, but these facilities are aging. Um, the average um, average nuclear power plant in the United States is about 40 years old, and uh, they are struggling with the uh, changing uh, price of energy. The drop in energy prices that we've seen happen over the last few years has really put a lot of pressure on these nuclear plants because their operating costs are primarily um, largely fixed. It just takes, uh, uh, regardless of the, of the level of uh, power that's being generated, they, there's a, a substantial cost for operating those facilities. So, um, so, so there we, you know, based on the research that EDRP did, we, we believe that there are, are many of these uh, nuclear plants that are going to be closing in the near future. And the key here is for economic development professionals to be proactive, to work with your federal, state, regional, and local partners to develop uh, plans. Um, these nuclear plants, uh, in many cases, are a very large part of a community's tax base, uh, as well as the, the uh, compensation level for these jobs are very high. And, and often very difficult to replace those jobs in, in rural areas. The shale revolution is here. I think that's it's pretty abundant. Um, it's had a big impact on our nation's economy. Uh, many manufacturing sectors now are, are more competitive globally. We're seeing uh, manufacturing sectors grow that are, uh, that are energy dependent and growing rapidly. Um, but it's having an impact on, on communities as well, too. This map depicts where the, uh, the major shale plays are in the United States. Uh, right now, about 33% of the country's uh, energy is coming from natural gas. Renewable energy. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of investment in renewable energy around the United States uh, in the last few years. Um, and, uh, some of these uh, industries are, are producing a lot of job opportunities. So I can just tell you in our state, in Iowa, that was, it just in, in our, our, our paper this morning, the fastest growing occupation over the next two years in Iowa is going to be uh, wind turbine service technicians. So um, it's really transforming uh, many economies uh, throughout the United States, both solar and, and natural gas. And we're going to be hearing more about um, the important role that sustainability plays um, in, um, in, in talent as well as business attraction as part of our case study here. These maps depict really the, the growth in the, uh, the solar and, and, and wind generation in the United States. Um, 9.5 gigawatts of solar was added uh, in the United States in 2016. And uh, the map down below shows the major uh, wind generation areas. 
you know, Texas leads the United States in wind production, followed by Oklahoma and uh, Iowa. And um, right now, one new wind turbine is produced every two hours in the United States. So you can see um, the impact that's also having from a manufacturing sector capacity. So how are these, how are communities harnessing renewables for economic development, um, business attraction? Um, in, the, in the report, there's a case study on Buffalo and, and how they, um, you know, benefit in, in the renewable energy. Iowa has um, seen a lot of growth in, in wind energy. Uh, our utilities are embracing that, and that's uh, been able to we've been able to attract some data centers uh, because of that renewable energy. Um, so wind farms, as well as um, solar uh, facilities, have a, a big impact on communities' uh, tax base, uh, and also. Um, um, also, it generates income, at least in, in Iowa here, for uh, farmers that are leasing their land for these wind farms. They receive about, um, you know, five to ten thousand um, uh, dollars for every wind turbine that uh, per year for every wind turbine that's on their their farm field. So, uh, a, a big impact on community and a, a communities and a growing impact. So, so what? What other resources are available to help uh, economic development professionals? Um, we'd uh, direct people to the appendix of this report, as well as a number of useful links. Um, so I guess in summary, to give you a quick overview, I guess what we're trying to do with this report is, is connect the dots, start the dialogue about the changing energy landscape, and learn from our, our, our peers and uh, right now, we're going to hear a few few of these stories today. Turn it over to you, Rick. Okay. Well, thank you so much, David, for that excellent overview and kickoff to the webinar. Our next speaker, allow me to introduce Sandy Ratliff, Assistant Vice President and Community Impact Advisor at Virginia Community Capital. Sandy is a seasoned economic developer with over 28 years of experience serving the Commonwealth of Virginia. She works with new and expanding businesses to offer startup consulting, entrepreneurial growth mentoring, support community revitalization, and assist businesses to identify sources of capital to move their business plans forward. Before joining VCC, she worked as the business services manager for the Virginia Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity in the agency's Abington office. Sandy will be discussing directly Cole's impact in her community and what strategies economic developers are using to adapt and grow. Thanks for joining us today, Sandy. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity to share some examples of how this coal producing region is transforming into a new economy. Uh, we've been for years focused on our above ground assets, or excuse me, our below ground assets, and now we're really focusing on our above ground assets, and that's our mountains, the people, and the history and even more that I'll be sharing with you. Uh, historically, we've been using above ground assets and to com combat that decline, you know, we've been energizing and doing some additional things. Um, one of the things I should mention is that in the 80s and 90s, this region really felt a, a, a large impact in the declining coal market, but also during that time, we were hit by our textile industry moving offshore, leaving about a thousands without jobs. And this decline continued through 2014 with about 46% decrease in manufacturing jobs and a 45% decrease in coal jobs. So we knew we had to do something. So I want to share some examples of how this region of Virginia is diversifying and to kind of give you where we're at, if you look at a map uh, and you see where Virginia comes together with Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, and West Virginia, this is the area of Virginia that I am going to be talking about. First of all, I think I want to share some, some examples of what we've done. In 1988, the Virginia General Assembly created the Virginia Coalfield Economic Development Authority. What makes this different from other economic development organizations is that the coal and gas industry 
in Southwest Virginia said, we need to do something. We need to diversify this area and we want you to use some of the taxes that are created to fund this organization. So they receive uh, a quarter of 1% of all the coal and gas severance tax within this uh, seven county region. And it's used to diversify the area and it's working. Uh, since the 40 started, they have uh, invested over $205 million in funding to uh, for loans and grants to over 314 projects. But the biggest thing is the, the impact. Those investments have generated an additional $5.8 billion of new investment in 37,000 jobs. And the picture that you see um, on the screen is a Tempur-Pedic. If you sleep on a Tempur-Pedic mattress or a pillow, the chances are really, really good that that was manufactured in Duffield, Virginia. We also have a strong presence in the technical field of, with organizations like Northrop Grumman, CGI, uh, Crutchfield Corporation, and others. So there's things that are happening, but there's much more that, that we're doing. Um, in 2008, the General Assembly created the Friends of Southwest Virginia. And what that was focused on is building a sustainable uh, economy preserving both our uh, history and showcasing the region's um, heritage because we're rich in arts, uh, culture, music, and crafts. Um, and what this organization is our promoter, they're marketing this region to tourists to come in and take advantage of what we have to do. And to help the artisans, uh, they constructed in 20, uh, a 29,000 square foot artisan gateway in Abington, Virginia, which is right off Interstate 81 where arts and craft makers in Southwest Virginia have an opportunity to showcase their arts and sell them. So it's given them a platform. It's kind of like the Amazon, I should say, of Southwest Virginia to help these, these artisans uh, attract. And you can see that it's helped um, local travel related taxes increase by $26 million uh, in, this, in this area. Whoops. I need to go back one. How can I go backwards? Okay, sorry about that. Also, this area is very rich on music. Um, this is where the birthplace of country music started. And in 2003, we wanted to, to try to help cult cultivate that, um, the music and culture that we have. And so today we have over 60 cultural music venues along this, what we call the Crooked Road Heritage Trail. And you can see the map below of how far that goes, but basically it's helping towns create venues and, and bring tourists in to, to hear um, some of the, the local musicians that, that are here. And the economic impact, as you can see, is over $9.2 million that's helping these rural communities. And, and it's helped create at least 131 full-time equivalent jobs that we didn't have before. So we know that this is working. And I should say that if you are a fan of country music, you've probably, probably heard of Johnny Cash and June Carter. Well, the Carter family had started bluegrass in Southwest Virginia, and we have the Carter Fold that's still operating by family members today in a little town called Hilton's, Virginia. <coughs> This area uh, is no secret with, with the mountains. We have lots of opportunities. And in 2008, we, the General Assembly have passed legislation creating the Southwest Virginia Recreation Authority, which is basically turning some abandoned mines and trails into ATV trails and hiking and biking and equestrian opportunities. We have over 400 miles here in Southwest Virginia, and I can say that this is really transforming some coal towns because what it is is it's getting people off these trails and they're going into our restaurants and they're staying in hotels and they're enjoying craft beer and, and listening to bluegrass music. And this is all part of a, a tourist destination um, and they're spending weeks uh, in some cases and there's thousands participating on this trail um, weekly and our plans are to grow that to 500 miles and there are some great scenic opportunities along this spearhead trail so if you have an ATV 
you may want to come down and visit us, uh, or if you're into hiking and biking, uh, good luck on that because there's a lot of hills and that'll test your, your endurance. Also, many people do not realize that we're home to the Clinch River Valley, and it's a uh, river that is one of the most biodiverse rivers uh, in the nation. And it has created a local grassroots effort to develop towns uh, and communities along this Clinch River to um, recruit tourists that are interested in kayaking and staying at uh, Airbnbs and restaurants uh, along the, the this the struggling areas, and they're seeing great benefits within that. And again, this is providing new tax base to these towns that were ready to board up, and it's bringing hope into these rural communities. So it is bringing opportunities. And again, it's another example of us taking advantage of our above ground assets to re to bring people in into tourism and create new job opportunities. Probably one of the best examples of diversification um, and um, is Buchanan County, which is historically been Virginia's largest coal producing county. Actually, today I'm sitting in the heart of Buchanan County uh, to doing this webinar. Um, this, this area has been hit extremely hard by the downsizing in the coal industry, but they are fighting back. Um, a number of years ago, they decided they wanted to take, uh, redevelop a 3,200 acre former strip mining site and turn that into a mixed use development where they have both industrial recreation, industrial and recreation parks there. Uh, an example of how that's working, Sykes Enterprises op op operates a help desk facility employing over hundreds, as well as a new training center that is under construction. Another example of, of how that, um, that abandoned property is turned into generating new tax revenue, a couple of local uh, 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 or, uh, men that owned an engineering firm here in Buchanan County decided they didn't want to invest their profits into the typical ways like some of us would do in stocks and CDs and so forth. They wanted to invest in the development of what today is called the Southern Gap Adventures, which they offer ATV trails, campsites, RV sites, cabins, and under construction, they have a new visitor center that we can sell local arts and crafts. Uh, and it's also a place for local uh, musicians to play music. Uh, the county has been involved uh, over the past eight to 10 years in bringing in herds of elk. And today, those efforts are creating one of the most unique trails for wildlife viewing, which is showcased in the July issue of ATV and Side by Side Illustrated, which I'll be honest, I didn't know there was such a publication out there. But they did an article about this Cole Canyon and the diversity, it was, they compared it to what you would normally see somewhere in Colorado or Montana. And now here in far Southwest Virginia, you have an experience running, riding your ATV along these trails. But they didn't stop the diversification there. In 1997, they decided to take an old school building that had said empty. It's actually my old junior high uh, building and open a, a law school, uh, which is the Appalachian School of Law, which they have had success with that. And they decided, okay, we want to continue that momentum. We have another vacant um, school building and let's turn that into a school of pharmacy, which they did in 2005. And they're not stopping there. Their uh, plans are underway to open up a third uh, school focused on veterinarian science. So those projects uh, have helped generate new revenue and hope to this community. And they're also exploring the use of reclaimed mining sites to grow niche uh, market certified herbs and barley and apples and hops to help support the demand in the industry, especially uh, with our craft beer that we have that's growing. Actually, Virginia established a craft beer trail last year and that's growing. So that's creating an opportunity for these people to, to grow uh, crops and to, and to sell it. To help nurture entrepreneurs to invest opportunities in outdoor and cultural development and diversify the markets here, Virginia 
Community Capital created the New Economy Loan Fund. This fund is focused on the nine coal impacted counties of Southwest Virginia, and we're offering capital, business counseling, and community development support. So we're, we're not only trying to create the venues, at, but we're also putting the mechanism in place to where if you've got an idea, let's see if we can float that into a business and we have fi financing to help you. And we're actually getting ready to start a, a business plan challenge here in Buchanan County next spring. Although many of these communities continue to struggle, diversification efforts are paying off. I should note that we are seeing an uptick in mining due to the demand of a certain type of coal that, that we used to compete with Australia for, and they mined out, so we have that market that is picking up. But I will say that, that the efforts to diversify have not changed, and the communities, I think the consensus is, is let's keep pushing ahead and push hard. Thank you uh, for your op for the opportunity to share about Southwest Virginia, and I invite you to come visit, see for yourself what this region has to offer, and when you do, bring your family and friends with you. And thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy, and thank you for sharing so many interesting and exciting examples of how your region in Virginia has responded and is responding to the challenges underway in transitioning from the coal industry from underground to above ground. Thank you very much for sharing that. Joining us next is Scott Martinez, president of the North Louisiana Economic Development Partnership and also a member of EDRP. Scott is in his sixth year as president of the North Louisiana Economic Partnership. With offices in Shreveport and Monroe, Louisiana, his organization serves 14 parishes in North Louisiana with funding support from over 200 public and private sector members. NLEP is one of less than 70 accredited economic development organizations in North America, and it ranks in the top 10 globally for the number of certified economic developers on its staff. Scott has worked in economic development in three states, including positions in Houston and Austin, Texas markets, and in his home state of Mississippi. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Ole Miss, as well as a Master of Science degree in economic development from the University of Southern Mississippi. He's been designated a certified economic developer by IEDC, and he serves currently on its board of directors. Scott will be discussing the impacts and the economic development effects of natural gas and oil in his community. Take it away, Scott. Thank you so much, and thank you for allowing me to, to visit with you all this afternoon. Okay. Today I'm going to give an overview of the sector, and many of this is many of these the things I'll cover are actually in the EDRP um, document. But I also want to go into a little more detail on its impact on North Louisiana, and as well as some trends that I've seen in the state of Louisiana and nationally. So today I'm going to go over the emergency of the shale plays natural gas, LNG, which has been very dominant in the state of Louisiana, and in particular South Louisiana, and the impact we've seen that the shell plays in North Louisiana where, where I work, as well as um, in other areas, um, and discuss how it's impacting us in regards to economic development. So after World War II, this information is in the, in the EBRP document, um, oil became much more prominent as it was utilized as um, companies started using uh, products that were driven by oil and gasoline, as well as um, the, emergence of, the emergence of the chemical sector. The United States, as you know, is both the major oil producer and consumer, and we're still a net importer, but now we're exporting 10 million barrels a day, which um, allows the United States to has, has now reach its lowest import level in 20 years. So if you look at the top U.S. oil fields by reserves, you see many in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the you know, the, no surprise in Texas and um, North Dakota and out west in California. To give it a little local flavor of, for how it's impacted our region, just the history of it, the first overwater oil well, which actually um, was offshore, which really gave the emergency of offshore drilling, was actually done in Caddo Parish, northwest 
on Lake Caddo, northwest of Shreveport. That's how the first offshore rig looked, and that was actually in Caddo Lake. So before it went to the Gulf or into the Pacific, and some of the other areas around the world where you see offshore exploration and extraction today was actually in Caddo Lake here in North Louisiana. So you've seen natural gas, when I came to North Louisiana almost six years ago, you saw it very dominant with companies like Chesapeake and BHP Billiton which is an Australian-based energy company, and, and so a very, very dominant and, and, and overnight millionaires um, really develop in North Louisiana. It changed the culture of many of the rural parishes where shell gas, and that was now available through fracking, um, made it profitable to extract that, that resource. So fracking now represents 67% of the total natural gas output. Um, and that's increased over 1,400% since 2000. So it's been, you've seen a lot of companies in North Louisiana and Shreveport in particular that have large, uh, a large presence in the Bakken Shell and the Eagleford Shell in South Texas, and they're all interrelated because they're utilizing the same technology um, and a lot of the same resources in many instances. So these are the shell plays, and this was shown earlier and the area I cover is, what I want to talk about specifically is, um, is the Haynesville Shell, which straddles North Louisiana and East Texas. When that, when that really became prominent, again, we saw local revenues, um, tax revenues in DeSoto Parish in particular, triple in some cases. I have a friend that's a banker in DeSoto Parish, and his Deposits went from $200 million to $480 million in one year. That shows the exponential impact it had on the economy in that, one, in that particular parish. And when it first started, we saw a lot of um, the infrastructure being developed. DeSoto Parish was very rural. We saw eight new hotels um, be constructed within an 18-month period. We saw revenue to the school districts um, the school districts and the local taxing bodies in DeSoto Parish really uh, increased. And as a result, DeSoto Parish schools are now one of the few A-rated schools in North Louisiana, and they invested heavily in new school facilities. It's one of the best school systems in the state of Louisiana because of that investment that was made possible through the Haynesville Shell uh, play and, and through the technology that was developed utilizing fracking. So you saw our shell production in North Louisiana really peak. This slide cut it off. Um, really peaked about 2012, and 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 it, it's come down as the natural gas prices have come down, uh, have decreased. So, but at at its peak, um, it was really producing a lot of activity as far as construction, as far as service companies, and just an array of things were happening because of the Haynesville Shell and the Shell play. So just to put that in production, in perspective, nationally 169,000 jobs were created between 2010 and 2012, and it grew, that industry grew 10 times faster than the overall U.S. employment. So one of the big things that we have in North Louisiana, which is problematic, is if you look at a map of pipelines in North Louisiana, it really looks like a spider web. A lot of it's moving natural gas and oil and other things. But what it does for other economic development projects is it becomes problematic putting together tracts of property for other economic development projects like distribution centers, which we're seeing a lot of activity in that particular sector. So the pipeline um, in Mexico continues to be a, a key player as far as taking the natural gas, and we're even seeing um, even some of the Mexican companies um, be active in the shell plays and investors from, from Latin America that are now in North Louisiana are very active. Natural gas processing plants, 
we've seen a lot of growth in South Louisiana with ethylene crackers and LNG export terminals. What the liquefied natural gas allows is, um, it basically, as the name um, would lend, it, it liquefies natural gas and allows it to be shipped, uh, not just through pipelines, but actually has created a better export market for um, the natural gas through the liquefica liquefaction process. So we've seen multi-billion dollar investments along the Louisiana coast as well as the Texas coast for these LNG terminals with for export um, to foreign markets. Some of the implications that we've seen huge investment in the state of Louisiana on um, projects related to ethylene crackers and and some of the things that are driven by natural gas. Sasol um, is a South American company that invested, investing um, $8.9 billion in the first phase of a project in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The problem that's been created down there, as you would imagine, with 5,000 construction jobs with a community that size, has been finding the professional trades people to build the facility and um, and some of the construction companies that are having to come in to build something this massive. There's been some really significant labor challenges in that market, and one of the things they've done is they've actually had to bring in workers from other countries to, to do welding and some of the things just to get the numbers that they needed. I know they had a group of welders, a pretty large group down there from the Philippines, and they've set up uh, worker camps and some of those type things, as they've done in North Dakota, and some other places, but it's really created some public policy challenges and a lot of analysis as they look at the housing that, that has to be developed um, to support um, operations like this. And then looking at it from a, a tax and incentive perspective, how do you treat something that's massive that, that's equitable to the local community? So that's all um, decided not to go forward with the debt space of this project at this time, but still the initial project is $8.9 billion, so that's you know, seven or eight auto plants, if you're looking at it from a capital investment perspective. So it's pretty significant. Hitler Steel Tube in Shreveport is now operational, and eventually they'll have 675 jobs. That represented a billion dollar investment and this was a project that North Louisiana won over uh, Victoria, Texas, but they looked at over 100 communities before they ultimately chose Shreveport for this facility. Again, this is a billion dollar investment. It's a German company. Um, it's the first facility like this they've done in the United States. Um, there's also a second phase that will actually consist of a steel mill. Once they announced this project and began construction, there was a downturn in the market and so they didn't ramp up as quickly as they'd initially anticipated, but there are over 500 jobs um, at the latest count, and these are good paying jobs. And what's interesting is it really changed the focus of, of how our community approaches workforce development and the resources that are being put in to workforce development for manufacturing facilities. The driver in this project, um, and this company makes steel tubes, seamless steel tubes for downhole um, drilling applications and tubing um, that serves, you know, the oil and natural gas market. And this was kind of the sweet spot. But the driver for this project was not only um, the site right there on the Red River at the port of, of Caddo Bozier, but it was the training that the state of Louisiana and local partners put forward to get this project uh, across the finish line. Um, state and local partners that spent $22 million to construct a 65,000 square foot training facility at Bossier Parish Community College. This uh, facility was initially designed and has the same machinery and the line that the, the steel mill has um, at the facility, excuse me, the, the tubing plant has at the facility. So they can train, train employees at this facility using the actual machines um, that are going that were at that time going to be at the facility and allow the workforce to really ramp up because there wasn't that core group of um, 
of, of skilled labor in that particular field. And so now what's happened is once Bittler gets ramped up, we're using this asset for other manufacturing facility, manufacturing companies. It's really become a show place and has been received very favorably by site consultants that have toured it and companies that have toured it uh, that are considering North Louisiana. Site development, this is something as that um, that's become problematic with all of the, the gas wells that have been that have been drilled in. This is DeSoto Parish, Louisiana, but also you see it in South Bossier Parish, you see it in South Caddo Parish. What happens is all of these dots you see on this aerial map, those represent gas wells. So when I'm trying to develop sites for other type projects, it becomes problematic because of all of the, the wells and the, the pipeline infrastructure. DeSoto Parish is really hard to put even a hundred acre site together because of the encroachment from the from the wells and the pipe pipelines that support that that activity there, so um, it kind of changes the focus of what we have to work on. So our group, the North Louisiana Economic Partnership, we cover 14 parishes. We have an office in Monroe and Shreveport. In the past five years, we've announced companies like General Dynamics, uh, IBM. We're headquarters to CenturyLink, uh, which is a Fortune 150 company. Uh, many people may think that's based in Seattle or Denver, but the headquarters is actually here in Monroe, Louisiana. So we've really developed a vibrant technology sector um, that really has nothing to do with oil and gas. So that diversification of our economy and the mix of our economic drivers in the region, we recognize that as being important. North Louisiana has been has experienced boom and bust when it, in regards to oil and gas. Um, like I showed you earlier, since the early 1900s when they first started doing uh, over the water drilling, which eventually evolved into offshore drilling, many people's livelihoods, and, and there were lots of fortunes and family fortunes that have passed on through multiple generations um, that have been supported by this industry. But we recognize through the bust of the 80s and before the, the, the prominence of the Haynesville Shell, that we couldn't have all of our eggs in one basket. Um, we invested in a strategic plan that, that really gives us a strategy and a framework on how we market our region and did a great assessment of our in, the inventory of our assets in the region, and that's really helped us be successful. Last year, we announced almost $300 million worth of projects that's direct investment in this market. And this is still a relatively small market and predominantly rural, even though our the area we serve is 800,000, just over 800,000, is spread out and the predominance of our region is still rural. So we're continuing to see diversification away from that in a very um, methodical way because of what's been experienced here for generations. Um, through oil and gas. So we look at some of the things that, and this is from the EDRP manual, but I just want to relate it to some of the things that we've done here in North Louisiana. The revenues from the royal royalty payments, impact fees, and these are just some of the best practices to consider. Um, Caddo Parish, for instance, they ended up with an $80 million windfall from um, some of the leases on the um, parish-owned properties. When I say parish, that's the equivalent to a county. Louisiana has parishes and not counties. Um, they ended up with an $80 million uh, windfall from some of their leases that went into the public coffers. They're one of less than 30, I think there are 36 parishes and counties in the country that have a AAA bond rating. They have the highest bond rating. Um, uh, that you can get for a public body like theirs. They've looked at making investments on things that are not long-term financial commitments. So they don't spend this, their non-recurring revenue, if you will, on recurring expenses. And again, they put money into groups like ours, the Soto Parish, all these governments have put money into organizations like ours to make sure that we're continu continuing to diversify the economy. 
And again, we've looked at the Soto Parish in particular, they've looked at some of the hidden cost of what it takes for and the impact on the roads and some of the things in that parish and have planned accordingly financially to make sure that they cover those long-term costs. And we've looked at things uh, that are not necessarily directly related to the oil and gas sector that we can turn into some, some um, long-term plays. Our natural gas rates are low, which tends to be it's advantageous for other manufacturers that we bring in, but um, that's a good value proposition for us. We, um, we, we continue to make sure that our, the taxes that are received are done in a way where we're doing things like building a training center that's not just focused on oil and gas, but also that training center I showed you earlier, they do IT training, they do a lot of training for general dynamics, um, it has a large uh, technology center um, adjacent to that community college campus. So we make sure that we're much more flexible with how we're doing things and not just putting resources in that one sector. And again, we invest strategically in, in workforce development. If you look at our organization, we've got equal standing between our economic development activities business recruitment, retention, um, and and growth. That's on the same plane as workforce development. We've got a senior VP for workforce development that's involved with K through 12 through higher education. Um, and our region has 11 colleges and universities with 60,000 students. So we act collectively when it comes to workforce development and work very well between the different institutions of higher learning. We've done a lot of work with our local governments so they understand and the volatility of this sector because the graph I showed you earlier was some of the production from the Haynesville Shell. They were, it was very uh, lucrative, but they, for the most part, planned very well. They've invested in schools and infrastructure and things that are long term. And there's a lot of transparency that they look at when they do things. If you, all of our meetings are obviously public, but there's a lot of attention play that's paid to that revenue and that fund that was built through the, the Haynesville Shell dollars in Caddo Parish as well as in this other parish. And that concludes my remarks. Um, if I have any recommendations, is continue to from our, our perspective and our experience in oil and gas, is we've been very fortunate to have been in this active in this sector for through its up, ups and downs and, and our leadership is very cognizant that it is a volatile sector and we need to um, look at economic development in a comprehensive way and not just focus on this one sector. We don't do incentives for oil and gas companies as far as the extraction. If it's a manufacturer like Mentler Steel, obviously there were incentives involved there, but um, natural gas is here. The oil is here, and um, that's a resource that's that's not movable. Um, so we don't see the the need to put this, the economic incentives and those extraction activities and exploration activities. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Well, thank you, Scott, and thank you for that uh, very uh, good insight uh, into those case studies and the advice and recommendations there regarding the effects of oil and natural gas on your community. Our final speaker today is Sana Kendall, Economic Health Manager for the City of Fort Collins, Colorado, where she focuses on business retention and expansion, talent development and recruitment, and special projects that ensure a vibrant Fort Collins economy. Sana is the Project Manager for the City's Broadband Strategic Plan and Business Engagement Action Plan. She serves on several boards, such as the Front Range Community College Foundation, IEDC's Sustainability Committee, Northern Colorado Manufacturing Partnership, and the Economic Development Council of Colorado. She's also a member of the Economic Development Research Partners, IEDC's, uh, and the EDCC and the American Institute of CPAs. Today, she'll be discussing how her community is taking advantage of renewable energy for economic development. I'll hand it over to you now, Sana. 
Thanks so much, Rick. Um, and thanks to IADC for asking me to talk a little bit about what uh, Fort Collins is doing in terms of um, the changing energy landscape. So, let's see here. Let me see if I can get these slides to events. Here we go. Um, in 2012, the City of Fort Collins City Council actually formed what's called the Sustainability Service Area. Um, we are among the first, if not the first, municipality to structure all three components of the triple bottom line under one service area. So we've got um, environmental services, social sustainability, and economic health. Um, our office actually is called economic health instead of economic development um, because we're really looking at a holistic view of long-term vision and alignment with the community values. Um, in 2015, we updated our economic health strategic plan to focus on five specific areas, community prosperity, grow our own, place matters, the climate economy, and think regionally. Um, and I'll discuss climate economy a little later in the presentation, but wanted to kind of give some grounding back, uh, background information as well. So why are cities involved in terms of renewable energy and the discussion and conversation around that? And I think one of the biggest pieces that we discuss are cities, cities are on the front line of developing and partnering on innovative solutions to address climate change. Um, here in Fort Collins, we have a climate action plan that has uh, goals to reduce greenhouse emission gas for our community. So based on that, one of the biggest conversations is how do we move from this aspirational goal to, a goal to a, um, operational? And I think one of the largest conversations is what is economic development role in that? Um, Fort Collins has a, a focus target industries and around clusters specifically. Um, and again, clusters are geographical concentrations in interconnected companies and institutions. So for Fort Collins, we have five cluster areas that we focus on, clean energy, water innovation, bioscience, technology, and a cluster that we called uniquely Fort Collins. And those are companies that are headquartered out of Fort Collins. Um, in 2015, Fort Collins was recognized as a place of invention at the latest exhibit by the Smithsonian's London Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the National Museum of American History, recognizing Fort Collins as one of six communities where they talk a lot about the triple bottom line as well as what we call the triple helix. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So the Triple Helix is really a collaboration through the university, higher education, the city, and the business community. And so Colorado as a whole is ranked seventh in renewable energy. According to the Renewable on the Rise report, the U.S. today produces nearly six times as much renewable energy from the sun and wind than it did in 2008. In Colorado specifically, 11,030 gigawatt hours was generated in 2017 alone, enough to power 1 million homes. Um, when we talk about um, Northern Colorado, where Fort Collins is located, Vestas has a um, home here in Windsor, Colorado, and employs about 1,300 employees. They, um, Vestas here works with the Workforce Center and the Community College, as well as it has created opportunities for supply chain. The picture on the top is Colorado State University. One area that I wanted just to highlight, um, which is the powerhouse, which houses the Energy Institute. Um, the Energy Institute's main goal is around energy innovation that supports clean energy startups. You know, as we as economic developers really start to, um, learning more about utility companies such as Excel Colorado, who develop plans to take coal plants offline and invest in wind, solar, or other energy sources, we as economic developers are tasked with how do we support the existing community and how do we help also those that are interested in our community innovate and bring new companies and organizations within the community as a whole. 
One area um, that we discuss a lot in economic development is why businesses, um, what is businesses' role in this? Uh, one of the biggest things um, is to discuss with the business community on how do we align and how do we start the conversation early and often around sustainability efforts that each of our communities have. Uh, businesses' concerns around reliability in the service, the quality and the outcome of the energy that's being consumed, the cost of the impact of going to um, renewable energies is a large conversation that we're having in our community, as well as around energy storage. What is that going to look like? Some of the things we discuss with our businesses and in our community that I think is unique is um, we have really low unemployment, less than 2% unemployment right now. And a lot of, when we look at number six, employee retention and attraction, when we talk about tech companies, innovative companies in our community, one of the things that will help you become an employer choice or a differentiator, a lot of times has to be around the business's sustainability goals as a whole. Um, I found a quote from Elliot Metzger from the World Resource Institute that I think is very interesting and um, something that we aspire to as well is companies like DuPont, Nike, and IBM are looking ahead to see how natural resources, climate change, and energy drive innovation and inspire new business models, products, and services. That's been something that we've been talking with our regional partners, whether it's the university, Colorado State University, our Chamber of Commerce, our regional economic development groups, um, some of those aspects that I think are interesting and things that we think about as next steps as we move the dial. Some programs that I wanted to talk about that we at the city have that have helped really with that conversation. One is called ClimateWise, which is a free voluntary program that helps Fort Collins businesses reduce their impact, save money, and gain recognition for their achievement around energy and water conservation, waste reduction, alternative transportation, and social responsibility. And again, if, if you recall in that past slide where I talk about kind of top 10 reasons why for businesses, um, this is almost similar to a buy local. When you see this badging system, Folks, businesses in our community have quite a bit of pride around this Climate Wise badge, um, and it's a way for our consumers, our, our buyers, to really see um, the differentiator of they, they care and invest in our community and have the same values that the buyer does. Other um, benefits of the Climate Wise program is really around networking and the opportunity to share best practices among the business community. Also, there are rebate and incentive programs in here, a lot um, around education. Um, and one unique thing about this program is we do uh, track a lot of the metrics and talk about the cost savings. Um, and so that's an extra piece that I think is really, how do we share the value of what is being done? And that's through the metrics. A unique program that we um, kicked off last year was called Innovation Fort Collins Challenge and Innovation Summit, or Innovate Fort Collins. And it really was to support the development and commercialization of new technology. Um, it was an opportunity to engage a diverse population um, and demonstrate the greenhouse gas reductions within our community. So we're in our second year of this program. It's a competitive bid pr uh, process where businesses and partners alike can put together proposals around this innovation summit to reduce greenhouse gases in our community. So I mentioned that uh, the climate economy was one of our focuses in our office here at Economic Health. Um, our vision is really to help businesses adapt to climate change by staying in our community and leveraging community carbon reduction goals to develop new products and services. Um, we have a unique position in our office. It's a climate economy advisor um, whose background really is around public-private partnerships. Um, how do we help businesses scale in terms of um, gaining access to capital, eliminating re or reducing the policies and processes barriers, and giving opportunities for demonstration projects? So um, in 
in this year, we've been exploring what's called city as a platform and how do we give access to infrastructure the city might have uh, to allow companies to test their ideas and innovate around that as well. And lastly, I think um, we, I would be doing a disservice without talking about challenges and opportunities ahead. Um, it's not just about the jobs in our community, it's about the ability to innovate, collaborate, and be at the forefront to support our businesses that are here and ones that want to be in our community in the future. Um, so opportunities are galore, right, in terms of the partnerships and the regionalism, um, the ability to have transferable skills. Natural gas happens to be um, a big conversation in our communities and in, at the regional level and the transferable trade skills that that allows. Um, the challenges that we've seen in our area is national strategies driving the energy market. So we talk about the renewable electricity production tax credit and the impact it has had in um, Northern Colorado, let's say at the um, Vestas um, wind production, wind turbine production and those impacts in terms of the job growth and the job stagnation in that area. So those are things that we've really tried to look at on in terms of challenges we're looking at ahead. R&D investment, um, access to capital and, and the asset utilization, which is where the city has a platform concept. Um, I know communities such as um, Vancouver and San Diego that have already started along this path to allow the ability to test innovative new ideas coming out of their community, the business community there, that is an interesting aspect as well. So with that, um, Rick, I believe I'm going to hand it back to you. Well, okay. Thank you, Sana. What a great uh, presentation and, and thanks for sharing that with us. Well, uh, we've been getting questions all through the presentations, uh, so I'll now start posing those to our speakers. Uh, I would just suggest that uh, all the webinar participants keep uh, sending in questions. We'll answer questions right up until the end of the, uh, of the, of the webinar. The first question uh, that came in, and I'm going to just take this literally, and I think, David, this was addressed to you in the opening remarks. And it says, what jobs are actually created by solar farms? Our experience is that the company that put in 55 megawatts of solar panels near our community, and the only two jobs, only jobs that were created were two security guards and a guy that works part-time to clean dusts off the panels. What are we missing? So Dave, any ideas or any, or the other presenters, any conversation points about uh, how to really understand the jobs associated or the impact of these solar panels. Are you still there, Dave? Rick, sorry, I, I was on mute there. Sorry about okay. that. No problem. I just um, thought that was a tough question and you were maybe uh, thinking it over. It, it is a very tough question because I think I think in solar probably the job generation is more in the solar production rather than the maintenance of the operations. Um, you know, there, in Iowa we're seeing a lot of growth in the wind turbine technicians that service the, the wind turbines throughout the state, which is a fast growing occupation. Um, but um, we're, we're you know we're, we're also seeing benefits just from business attraction from data centers and other companies that are coming here for green power, but I'm not really a solar expert, but I can understand that there probably aren't a lot of jobs required to maintain those facilities. We're seeing, uh, you know, Dave, or uh, we're seeing uh, more and more consultants and companies that come to us uh, with projects are really probing on uh, how much our electrical utilities can provide in renewable energy, what the mix is. In fact, they aren't considering uh, areas that don't have some mix of renewables. Maybe that's a way to get at that job impact of, uh, of solar panels and solar farms. I think, are you seeing that also in your area? Yes, we are. We are here in, uh, in Iowa as well, too. Yeah. Companies are Okay, the next. Yeah. 
Uh, Scott, I'm going to, the next question goes to you, uh, and it suggests that uh, the, the, the question, the webinar participant said, I believe you mentioned 67 percent of production comes from fracking. It says, obviously, this, uh, in this country, fracking has become a controversial subject. Do you have any insights as to resources that I could research to help educate our citizens regarding these processes? It has become controversial. You know, coincident, it hasn't been as controversial in North Louisiana, and I, and I don't know why we've seen, you know, our neighbors in Oklahoma and some of the other states, Pennsylvania, where there's been some environmental concerns and some of those issues raised. But to be quite honest with you, we haven't had, um, we haven't had the environmentalists um, or had any big environmental issues in North Louisiana for it. And I don't know if that has to do with us having a multi-generational culture that's been involved in oil and gas. And they're not as sensitive to it. Um, but we haven't had that issue in North Louisiana. And it, it, we may be unique in that regard. That could be. I've got another question for you, Scott, while I've got you. Uh, you touched briefly on the boom-bust cycle associated yes. with oil and gas. Uh, from a from a community economic development perspective, what challenges does this really present, uh, and how do you respond it, to it? It creates challenges when you have a bus and you have people that may not have a that have the that, ha, that may have a very limited skill set, and they try to enter the workforce in, in a sector that's not related to oil and gas, and those wage rates and some of the manufacturers that they could go to work for aren't at the level of the oil and gas sector. That's been problematic as far as that adjustment for some of the lower skilled workers going from sometimes very lucrative jobs in oil and gas and then trying to transition that into something else during a downturn. That's been very, that's been very problematic. Yes. Uh, here's a question for Sana Kendall. Um, and it deals, Sana, well, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, it deals with obviously your uh, community and your program is very uh, focused on um, uh, renewables, on climate change issues. And the question is that, you know, uh, just the concept of climate change in some parts of the country is pretty co controversial, both from an ideological and a political point of view. How did you in your community kind of move beyond some of the opposition that comes from those criticisms to be able to get such a robust program underway? Um, I think that has a lot to do with, um, again, having the conversation and understanding everyone's point of views. Um, we do a lot of work in, I, I should say, um, the climate economy is still a controversial topic in Fort Collins as well, so it's not like we have 100% agreement on that at all. Um, but I would say it really is having the conversation early and often, understanding where the businesses are concerned, why they're concerned. Um, a lot of it has to do with uncertainty, and being able to put data behind that is going to be your number one, I think, area that you can add value. We do a lot of partnering with um, folks outside of our organization, whether it's the universities, whether it's the chamber, um, whether it's regional partners. And I think that, again, it's just about having the conversation and understanding where the company is and where their views are on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this next question, David, will be back to you. Uh, you you really framed some conversation around large projects uh, that are being affected by the changes. Uh, nuclear, I think your comments were mostly around nuclear, but there's coal-fired plants and nuclear plants that when these facilities close, uh, often in smaller communities, they uh, really create tremendous dislocation in the economy. Uh, and it seems like there's never enough lead time. How, how does a community go about um, uh, when they first learn of this impending closing, uh, getting the efforts underway and in place to really be able to offset those job losses? They're often the best jobs in town. Uh, and how, do they, how does a community go about handling that? 
uh, yeah, I think from some of the case the case studies in the report is 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 basically just you know pulling together all the stakeholders in the region and developing uh, you know plans to diversify, which um, is is key. And and um, you know Scott mentioned that in some of his remarks uh, this afternoon as well too. And it and it's and it's a real challenge. Uh, it um, you know because in many cases those those uh, you know facilities are in in uh, you know rural areas and um, and uh, and it's just more of a challenge attracting companies but it's I think that the important thing is to start to be proactive rather than reactive I guess a follow-up on that would be maybe sandy to you a, a mine closing or shutting back or scaling back is very similar to a power plant shutting down in terms of the loss of good jobs and stable jobs. Uh, any comments you would have on that? Yes, I mean, a one big coal operation can um, uh, really impact, negatively impact a, a small community and, and that's been a challenge of all of this, this uh, seven county region of, of Virginia. And, you know, one of the things with the Southern Gap um, example is uh, we were able to work with um, uh, the environmental folks to turn some of those operations into, um, you know, either industrial parks or um, tourism-related functions. So we're, that's what we're trying to do is, is figure out ways that we can use those facilities. Of course, they're not paying the amount of money that, that um, the coal industry paid, but at least we're starting at some place and trying to diversify and not put all of our eggs into one basket. Sandy, here's a question for you. Uh, oftentimes when a big project closes uh, and someone loses their job, they may comment, I don't want another job, I want my job back. Uh, and, and yet they oftentimes have to find employment in a much lower paid uh, profession. Um, how do you help out with that? How do you, how does an economic developer help out with that? Whether it's uh, transition planning or, or, or training, well, just talk a little bit about that. Well, first of all, um, we try to um, offer retraining opportunities because you know that there are um, most of the time state and federal programs to help with retraining, but if they're, they're stuck on that, you know, we look at opportunities to maybe you know, you don't like what's available in the job market. Do you want to consider starting a business and, you know, investing some of the money that you had saved into to create an entrepreneurship opportunities? And we're seeing that through some of the diversifications that's taking place uh, in Southwest Virginia with the outdoor recreation and um, the, the cultural heritage. Um, it, it's challenging. There's no, uh, one size does not fit all, and there's a lot of work to do, but we're trying to, to be proactive in creating training and opening up opportunities uh, to spark uh, development in other areas to create jobs. As a follow-up question to, to you, Sandy, on that, um, and, and our, the questioner was very impressed with a number of different kinds of very innovative new programs tourism, recreation, trails, off-road, and things of that sort for uh, helping to diversify that re regional economy. But a question is, uh, are, what's the proportion of those jobs created in those industries that are filled by locals or, or the pr proportion that are filled by new people moving into the area? I would say 95% of those jobs are from local people, um, uh, which is what we want. Um, I even see people that are making, that are outside the area that are making investments. They're not interested. Um, they they want to create the jobs here. And, um, you know, some of the incentives that, that are put on the table for these uh, opportunities are based on, you know, local jobs. So we're trying to push those developments to, to create job opportunities here in Southwest Virginia. Here's a question for Sana. Um, you mentioned that your unemployment rate in uh, Fort Collins area is about 2%. Uh, and, and so what, I mean, what kind of challenges does that present in terms of uh, competing for new business or new industry with an employment rate, an unemployment rate that is so 
uh, so low? Um, well, quite a few, obviously. Um, one of the biggest aspects of that is understanding what skills sets we have in our community. Uh, we partnered regionally on an initiative called Talent 2.0 and to address the ability to um, help support those aspects of the low unemployment. So what we're finding is that there is a lot of folks who are underemployed, which means that they are taking jobs that they are overqualified for. So working with employers on how do we get them right skilled into the right position would be um, an opportunity that we've been having conversations as well on. So um, the talent strategy that we've been talking about um, is an important aspect. We talk a lot about the trailing spouses and how we can make sure that um, when we're bringing in executives that the, their spouse is also able to find employment in the community. It might not be in Fort Collins, it could be in our neighboring communities, but how do we help them because our employers don't think of us as municipals of I only do work in Fort Collins. They, they think of us as a region as a whole. So we've been really working on that conversation with our business community um, today in regards to that. Sana, here's a follow-up question for you. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, simple. It says, for Sana, why economic health? So I'm assuming they want you to elaborate a little bit on uh, the phraseology or the definition of economic health. Yes. Um, so we call ourselves economic health versus economic development. Um, and the reason why is um, I, I believe in our community, um, when we talk about economic development, a lot of folks had concerns around, are we looking at just the next big attraction? Are we looking at the next win on being able to um, attract a company and incentivize a company into this community? So we, we changed the name to Economic Health to really look at the sustainable long term. So our focus area is on business retention first, then expansion, Attraction is our fourth one. So we really look at, um, again, business retention, expansion, innovation, and then attraction. So it, it's not that we don't attract, it's that um, in terms of our priorities, business retention, helping the business we have in our community today be successful. So you don't see Fort Collins give much in terms of incentives to attract a new company, because what we're finding is most of those companies are looking to pit us against our neighboring community, let's say Loveland, um, and we want to make sure it aligns with our community vision for the long-term sustainability. Okay, thank you. Uh, Scott, here's an interesting question. Uh, it, uh, it says, you know, economic developers all across the country are dealing with uh, not enough uh, large uh, shovel-ready sites. Uh, given what you've suggested uh, regarding the presence of gas wells and pipelines, uh, does how does developing additional property come in conflict with your basic or indigenous industry? Well, it, the Haynesville Shell and, and those wells I showed was in a predominantly rural community, and they've reaped you know, significant benefits from that shell activity in those wells. We have been able to identify sites in that parish in particular through some reuse that we've been able to do uh, with some property adjacent to, an air, to the airport there instead of parish. So fortunately, we've got other spots in our 14 parishes where the Haynesville Shell and those wells aren't as are not as dominant, and we've been able to develop some large tracks. And we've got several tracks um, in northwest Louisiana um, that are you know 300 plus acres, but just in some of those areas that are where we have the uh, the significant shale uh, gas activities with the Haynesville Shell and where we've seen those wells drawn. Um, it's just hard to put it together, but it's you know it's those are rural parishes, and the residents of those parishes have reaped some significant economic benefits. So I think their future may be in something other than things that require large tracts. You know, they've 
they put significant resources into their school systems and STEM education and maybe technology companies. So we're looking at you know pivoting from some of those things in the areas of our region where we have this, uh, those limitations. What, what a follow-up question on that? And we cover uh, a very our we cover most of North Louisiana from the Texas border to the Mississippi border. So the Haynesville Shell makes up you know a portion of our total geographic area. Um, so you know, if you looked at that map that that David and I both showed as far as the shell activity, you know it only hits a portion of our region, and those re, th those areas that were significantly impacted by the Haynesville Shell were, as I said, predominantly rural. You know, Scott, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, there's one of your slides show the project that was going to create about 5,000 construction jobs. Um, that was in, in actually Lake Charles, Louisiana, in South Louisiana. Yeah, what, um, um, so that's along the what, kind of challenges, what kind of challenges does that create for an economic developer, you know, I mean, on given the housing stock issues, the in-migration of those temporary workers for that period of time? I think there's like a real challenge issues with that with projects like that because you end up with a lot of out-of-state contractors, and that project in particular received you know public incentives. So I mean, we've had members of the legislature not just in with that particular project, but in other other projects throughout the state where there's not that labor pull and those skilled trades for a project of that size. So they have to come in from out of state, and that's been a point of contention politically. But you know, you've got things that with housing stock, we've had these these worker camps that have been set up, just like we have in North Dakota and other places where you've seen this type of activity down in the Lake Charles area, and it's created some issues as far as planning and zoning. They've had to rethink um, all of those their ordinances related to the housing development and permitting because this is something and a product, of a housing product that um, is new that they haven't had to deal with before. And I think they've done a great job. Yeah. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our time. Let me, uh, there's, here's one that, Sandy, that is uh, maybe a little bit of a, a, a controversial one, that, but I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. The question is uh, regarding coal uh, and the I guess more recent political uh, suggestions that um, uh, that we can, by national action, bring coal back. Um, how does that play in a coal region, and how realistic is it uh, for that as a as a viable alternative, especially after you've made such progress in diversifying? Well. I don't think coal will ever be back to, to what it was. And I think communities, hey, I was a coal miner's daughter. I've been through these ups and turns all my life, and I know the coal industry. But I think communities are now at that point where, you know, we're not going to put all of our eggs in thinking that coal is going to come back. Yes, there may be some coal jobs, but, but how long will those last when this big seam of coal is mined out? What's going to be after that? So I, I think the progress that we're making will continue. As a matter of fact, I think communities are smart enough to say, okay, Mr. Coal Miner or Coal Industry, if you want to uh, start a mine here, would you put something in our incentive pot so we can continue that diversification efforts? Which that's really represented by the Virginia Coal Field Economic Development Authority when it was established, because the coal and gas industry is creating that economic development fund. To, to create diversification. So I think the communities have been through this many times and we're at that point where we're going to continue on with diversification efforts. Does it follow then, uh, Sandy or Scott, that there are some lessons that have been learned in coal country that might prove helpful in this next round of boomer bust cycles in the oil and shale uh, uh, sector in terms of the progress you've made because you had to make that progress in diversification. Are there lessons there that are transferable into the oil and gas areas? I think they are. Um, yeah, I mean, how, uh, how legislation can be created, especially locally uh, and regionally, 
And just example of where I'm sitting at in Buchanan County, what they've done is, you know, we didn't want to close the doors and board up the windows. We wanted to, to survive, and that's why they have two professional schools and one, another one underway, while they turned a big um, uh, reclaimed mining operation into an industrial and recreational park. So it's generating new revenue. And, and that new money that's coming from these students has really been a positive impact for this, this community. Yes, I do think that there's lessons that can be shared with some of the examples that we have with other um, uh, energy related communities. Very interesting. Yeah. Any comments on that, Scott? I feel the same way. I think it's just a, a, a different energy product, pretty much. Well, I'm looking at the set of questions, and it seems that we. Uh, we have almost run our participants dry on questions, so I'll uh, go into the real quick lightning round. Any of our panelists have any closing comments they'd like to make? This is Sandy. I think the biggest thing is creating that atmosphere where both um, regulators, um, community leaders, and community citizens can have a voice and create that future. And, and, and again, I use the example here in Buchanan County. Um, I think that's worked out. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Well, I think we're about to the end of our uh, allotted time. Uh, the story of American economic development, as the paper says, is also the story of energy. Uh, the fortunes of communities rise and fall as new technology unleashes growth and old methods lose competitiveness. Uh, this reality plays out with major implications for rural and urban communities and cities and regions across the country. So this has been a great uh, opportunity to take a pretty uh, high level dive into the uh, issue of the changing energy landscape. I think uh, we are uh, at the end of our appointed time. I personally uh, would like to thank David Maz uh, Sandy Ratliff, Scott Martinez, and Sana Kendall for doing such an excellent job in presenting your case studies and your information uh, for this important uh, webinar. Uh, you have on the screen an upcoming webinar on affordable housing and economic development, a rural approach, which is Thursday, August 23rd. So log on and register for that. Uh, and this is Rick Weddle, I'm president of uh, the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance, thanking you all for participating. Thank you very much.